Hi, let me read a very interesting weekly routine to you. This is a real person's routine, by the way. Pilates once a week, strength training once a week, aqua therapy once a week, functional training, swimming, breathing exercises, daily meditation with just a little trouble, golfing three times a week, followed up with posture exercises, and very recently. experimenting with intermittent fasting i'm sure you're imagining a very specific type of person a really fit and disciplined person perhaps even a fitness influencer well you're kind of right you could say that the person i'm talking about is very much an influencer and he's fit too he's huge on linkedin where he's part of their top voice program on twitter or x he has close to a million followers he's very popular online So really if you think about it he could turn into a fitness influencer if he wanted to but here's the thing i'm not talking about a young health obsessed fitness influencer instead what i read out was the routine of 72 year old health obsessed and i must add restless founder and chairman of Marico Harsh Mariwala Dear listeners, welcome to First Principles, the weekly leadership podcast from the Ken. I'm your host Rohin Dharma Kumar and this is part 2 of my conversation with Harsh Mariwala. Let's begin. Harsh, you said, life is learning. Life is doing new things, and you're constantly trying to figure things out by doing them. Like, for example, meeting customers, markets, factories, offices, etc. What is continuous learning for you? What's your model, <laughs> mental model of looking at continuous learning today? So, I think first of all, whenever that mindset of okay, I want to learn, whenever. i get an opportunity it need not be a structured learning it could be just interaction with anybody is there some some learning for me in that conversation or some observation or through reading or through listening so there is always that strong desire urge to to learn of course for me it's in areas where i'm interested in i I don't understand too much technology, so if you ask me to understand technology, I will never be able to understand that. But there is a constant desire to learn. For example, when I am doing my workout in the gym, one one and a half hours every day, there is always I am listening to some podcast. So to me, that's learning. You know, when I am traveling, I am I get time to read books. You know, so normally I'm when I'm traveling, I read my books. When I'm in the car, also it's constantly when i go for a walk i read, go listen to podcast so that that open mind to to learn something which and many times it may not result in any learning but i think spending energy effort in in trying to learn do you find it hard to not do anything for even a few hours yes <laughs> you're right absolutely right i am I have to be occupied all my time, all my. So I have started doing meditation and all that just to calm me down. <laughs> But otherwise, I have an active mind, and I want to go on doing things. Uh, so in a way, how has your meditation journey been? It's. I mean, I, <laughs> the teacher taught me. I'm mean, not a teacher, a friend who does meditation. I mean, she taught me to do for thirty minutes, and I said I can't do thirty minutes, so I've cut it down to nine minutes. Now. <laughs> This reminds me of okay. a very good friend. She's, sorry. This yeah. reminds me of a very good yeah. friend who was introduced to meditation by another friend yeah. uh, through an app, and he's like, "This is too slow. I'm yeah. going to listen to it at two x speed <laughs> so that it can get over faster." Yeah, but you know, I'm just experimenting a lot of things these days. I'm right. much more of a medical health uh, trip, you know. So I'm, I'm doing three. Just now, at after this at six o'clock, I have a, I have a forty minute breathing session. So there's a breathing guy who is an expert on breathing. Forty minutes, different types of breathing. Uh, I'll do it with him virtually. 
So I am doing a lot of things. I've started doing intermittent fasting for last one month just to experiment, you know, what it means. You're, you're very interested in health and fitness. You said that you yes. work out for about I've, an hour and a half. Yeah, I've lost 10 kilos in the last one few years. Yeah. What was the trigger for that? It was just I wanted to feel fit. And, and may I ask you, what's your fitness routine like? So it's, uh, it's, it's different on different days. Like twice a week, I'll do weights. Upper body, lower body, one and a half hours. So today evening after that breathing, I have a weight session. But I'll do it in the gym, yeah. Otherwise, I have a trainer in Bombay. Once a week, I do Pilates. I have a trainer. Once a week, yoga. Then once a week, I go to the aqua site. So many times it's two things in one day, you know. And then three times a week I play golf. So on the golfing days I don't because I'm spending four or five hours on the golf course. So I don't exercise other things. I, after golf I do my posture exercise just to improve my posture. So I think and one one day a week I do functional training planks and all that. Yeah. And what then in addition to that swimming or I like to swim also, you know. Hmm. What what's the is this something that you've always been interested in, fitness? It's, it was, but it's gone, gone on increasing my overall, shall I say, um, thrust on my personal health also has gone on. So it's now mental health, meditation, breathing, <laughs> a lot more. So could, can we expect then perhaps a Marico breathing foundation? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Marico, no. I think it will be no, no, nothing like that. <laughs> no, I was just uh, yeah. kidding only. Yeah. Uh, what are, in the last maybe 6 to 12 months, given that you're on this journey of also discovering newer aspects around fitness, what are some of the interesting things that you've personally learned, um, maybe new for you or like for anyone else around fitness, which, which are really on top of mind for you right now? Breathing seems to be one of them. I mean, I just started learning breathing about about a month back and they say it's beneficial to you in terms of stress, in terms of better quality sleep, uh, reducing anxiety, reducing impatience. I'm very impatient as a person, you know. That is why I asked you earlier, <laughs> do yeah. you find it hard <laughs> to not do anything? So, I think I go on trying and there are many newer theories come up, you know. So, the intermittent fasting came up in the last few years. So, I'm just trying out last one month. I, I thought I'd find it very, very difficult to do that, but I'm, I'm able to do that. So, but I think you go on, there are newer and newer theories come up, you know, but I like to combine, at least in terms of my physical workouts, I like to combine different aspects, whether it is Pilates or whether it is yoga or functional training or weights. And I think get the right balance depending on your age and depending on what you want to achieve in terms of your health. Is there something that we can do to get more people in India interested in active fitness? <laughs> of course, a lot. The potential is huge in terms of spending time. But we have seen that the overall awareness for health, uh, fitness has increased dramatically in the last few years. And it should increase much more because if you don't exercise, then it will have impact on your health in terms of overweight or stress or whatever. So it's... To me, exercise is a big stress buster. It depending on individual again. Some people music could be, some people it could be walk, it could be meditation. For me, it's exercise. Uh, this is very famous, uh, of course, former PayPal uh, entrepreneur Peter Thiel, who's also like yes. a VC. Yes. A very famous question that he asks entrepreneurs, which I want to put to you, which is, what important truth do very few people agree with you on. What is it that you believe in that few people will agree with? Phew. It's a difficult question. I think it's amongst entrepreneurs, you know, there is a... There is a strong belief that you need to take shortcuts, you know, and don't pay as much attention on governance. And... It's changing. But I think on governance is very important that you practice the highest standards of governance in the organization. Because if you are taking shortcuts, then you are creating a culture of taking shortcuts to meet 
certain challenges and that will haunt you as you grow. So many entrepreneurs, especially in early stages, they don't pay as much attention on, on governance. Number two, in the area of talent, you know, many entrepreneurs, they, to them, HR is a function which is much, much lower hierarchy compared to some other functions like manufacturing or marketing. To me, HR is there on top of, on par with any other function because ultimately it's the talent and the culture which will make you win the, win the marketplace, you know. But people don't realize that this is one area they need to they need to work upon. There is a war for talent, and that war for talent is has to be dealt as seriously as war for market share or growth. Have you seen this attitude changing when it comes to startups? Because increasingly younger startups, you see founders taking yeah. on the role of handling people and culture, etc. Yeah. Uh, I, compared to older organizations where it's seen as a function yes where yes. HR is responsible for talent and attrition yeah, etc yeah. some extent I don't know to I, I don't have that much detailed knowledge about the startups and you know what how is it different but I reckon that because they have built a new business based on some people and people's strengths so I reckon they will be paying much more attention to relatively older organizations I want to switch tracks here a bit, go back again to an interesting part in Marico's history. This was a period when one of the organizations earlier that you said mm. that partly inspired you to start Marico Hindustan Unilever, wanted to acquire mm. uh, Marico and like in the competition and, and in the subsequent this thing, they were slashing of prices, mm -hmm. deep discounts, mm -hmm. capturing your market, etc. Of course, with the benefit of hindsight, we know that that didn't happen. Yeah. Can you take us back through that period and what emerged from it and how you dealt with it? So, this happened in the year 1998 or so. We had just gone public. In 96, 96 you went 96 public. 96 went public, yes. So, it happened immediately after, one or two years after you went public. And Levers had acquired Tomco, which is a Tata's, Tata oil mills company. And one of the products through that acquisition was Nihar Coconut Oil. And that time, they were keen to grow through acquisitions. So they wanted to acquire us. And they they went public in the sense that they said, that, okay, we can, we'll acquire Marico. And they create, tried to approach me through bankers, directly also approach. And they... I mean, of course, when they didn't see that happening, they decided to scare us by saying that we will launch the product. We are far stronger, which they were, in terms of distribution. Their overall financial position. Uh, so there was a lot of fear in the organization what will happen to us, whether we'll be able to take them on. But I was very clear that we will take them on because, as I said, I was not after money. If I was after money, I would have sold off the company and, you know, relaxed. But I was very clear that I will take them on in a business which I had built up, which we knew inside out. So where can they attack us in the area of the product? Of course, they could attack us in terms of advertising spend, in terms of distribution reach. But we took some steps on all those fronts and then we decided to take them on. The market thought that we would not be able to survive, so our share prices fell down substantially. But over a period of time, they launched the product not once, but two, three times. They increased their market share, but not they didn't get market share from us, from some other weaker players. So they went to a market share of about 15% or so. And at some stage... What was they, your market share? It was about 50% or so. So at some stage, they started losing interest in this category because at that time, this product doesn't form a part of a global portfolio of Unilever, you know. So at that time, Hindustan Lever started getting more and more aligned to Unilever. And then they started neglecting that product or not investing in that product. Now, at some stage, I was able to convince them that I wanted to sell off, thinking that it will come to me automatically. But they decided to put the brand on auction and most other FMCG players participated in that acquisition auction. But we were very clear that we should get that acquisition. So we went a little bit overboard in terms of what we quoted. So we got that brand. So in a way, 
from selling it to them, we acquired the brand, and that was a big source of joy for us. Uh, huge celebration inside, emotional victory. So it was. How long did this period last from them so approaching you to you acquiring? To, it was them. quite a lot. We bought that brand in 2006. So first two, three, four years they were active. Then they were silent. Then their market share also fell down from 15 percent to about 10, 12 percent or so. So, but first two, three years were intensive competition. And then... How was it like inside Marico during those years? It was quite, uh, I mean, some people thought I was mad. I was not selling out to them. My internal team was behind me. Uh, the field force, which is the, f the sales force distributors, they, they had a bigger battle in terms of fighting levers in the marketplace. But when they started seeing the results and not impacting us, then our confidence went on improving. And then ultimately, uh, normally a stronger, strong brand gets least affected in a in a market share battle. The weaker brands lose out to the to the new entrant. So it comes down to the strength of the brand in yeah, the minds of consumers. Yeah, we over invested in that brand. We came up with advertising campaign which leveraged the benefit of coconuts. You know, coconut is very auspicious. So when you go into a new house in India, you break. When you get married, you break a coconut. So we built a story around that and that resonated with, resonated with the customers. I also want to talk about something which is connected, which I'm sure you've seen a lot of, which is really the way large conglomerates or organizations behave when it comes to competition. Mm. Now, you said that the Tata Group wanted to acquire you and then... Levers. Oh, sorry, my bad. Uh, yeah. The Levers. They acquired yeah. Tomco. My bad. Yeah. I mixed that up. Yeah, no, okay. uh, Levers wanted to acquire you and then they spent a lot of focus. Then they lost focus. Then finally, they decided to pull it on the block. Now, this is a common pattern that we've seen many times with large conglomerates because the most what people don't realize from the outside is that organizational focus of conglomerates yeah. is a very precious resource and it does not last yes. as long as startups yes. and their founders <sighs> resolves. Yeah. What would you like to advise? Because you talked about D2C earlier. And in many of those spaces, yeah. D2C entrepreneurs will go up at some point inevitably mm -hmm. against a conglomerate yeah. that says, I'm going to destroy you. Yeah. How should they learn to think about the way conglomerates behave about competition and disruption? So I think first of all, now let me give our own example, how we behaved. And there will be learnings from that to the potential person who's facing that threat. First of all, for us, it was everything. We, 70% of our turnover or 60% of our turnover came from parachute. It was highly profit making and we called it our resource generating engine. And we came to the conclusion that we have to protect our resource generating engine, come what may. So I think that was a starting point. Number two, it was so important to us that it got attention at the topmost level, starting from me to the head of those who were reporting to me, head of marketing sales, that we have to take them out. So there was a very high level attention given to this fight from our side. Now what happens in a company like Lever? This becomes one out of maybe 50 brands there. It gets delegated to two levels below the CEO, two or three levels below. They don't have the right same mindset to, to drive this. And because it is handled at middle senior level, it is not given as much attention. And we knew that, you know, it will not get attention. And sometimes it all depends on to some to what which extent they want to win in the marketplace for how long. And sometimes they just give up because this was not a part of the global portfolio. So they just gave it up, you know. You need to have the courage of your conviction to take that battle. You need to ensure that it gets top attention. Don't be emotional about that decision, but rational. You know, in this case, while taking them on, I we evaluated each and every aspect of the scenario where they can hit us, and we took corrective action. Went and met also at that time they were taking a battle with uh, Nirma. I met Karsan by portal. Went to Ahmedabad, meet him, just trying to find out what should we be doing. Enemy of the enemy is my friend, sort of. Thing. Not friend, but just to get inside in terms of what mm. does he think. So he also agreed with me, and then, so I think just this reinforced the decision to take them on. So I think the key thing is to look at 
what kind of game you want to play in the marketplace and also hope like like that focus it's hard for a large organization to sustain yeah, it over yeah, a period of yeah. time because people come and go Correct. organizational You're priorities right, keep yeah. changing yeah here it is case the entrepreneur it's existential there, yeah, yeah. to the organization itself yeah from our research is very clear that you love mental models right like you approach decision making organization building expansion etc through a process of mental models etc are there any mental models which you find yourself frequently referring to when you're faced with tough decisions which are your favorites in some senses not really. i didn't even know that i am following mental models so there are frankly. frameworks that you use i mean maybe a different word would be perhaps frameworks of growth uh, or strategy etc and stuff like that i don't remember having any particular framework in mind but yes frameworks we use in terms of analyzing what can happen so it's more analysis and different depending on the what issue you're facing how do you create a right to win or what should we be doing when you launch a brand it should be i mean normally it will go through a process of a brand should be easily memorable got it <laughs> easy to pronounce thing like that you know got it. but yeah you said I so mean, there is certain process which we follow it may not be captured in a in a proper framework but a certain process you follow even when it comes to say meetings yeah a lot of organization time goes into meetings you know and most of the members in the organization feel frustrated when they get invited to meetings but for a meeting you have to be very clear what is the object of the meeting who is called in that meeting not every person who should be called the meeting has to start on time because one or two key persons coming half an hour late means 10 other people are waiting for half an hour has to start on time and then meetings will not have any powerpoint presentation because they waste a lot of time so you send materials to read in advance it is taken as read only dialogues happen through the meeting and the chair of the meeting has to ensure that each person who is present in the meeting gets an opportunity to speak and dominant speakers will be invited last by the chair to speak and then at the end of the meeting there'll be a critique session how did the meeting go what were the positives what are the negatives and then after that the minutes have to go within two days after the meeting is over the next meeting starts with the review of the minutes of the earlier meeting if it is the same group which meets again and again so i'm just saying that there is a certain process we follow and i'm just giving a meeting example to ensure that it you follow that process because if you follow a certain process then the execution is far better hi it's me rohin again since we've started first principles i've met around 35 founders and ceos on this show i've loved every single one of the conversations i've had in fact i think i think i'm a better professional and entrepreneur today due to the many insights and tips that emerged from these conversations but i'd be lying if i also didn't admit that of late i've been wondering if our episodes and conversations are getting a bit too predictable and linear now i hate predictability both as a person and as a journalist so my first instinct is to try and change things radically but what do you think is first principles becoming a bit too safe predictable and linear for you too no yes i'd love to hear lots of feedback and tips from you my dear listener on what we can do to innovate first principles even further whether it's our questions our conversation formats our topics or even our guests please do write into us at fp@theken.com that's f p at the rate the hyphen ken dot com. Thank you. Do you remember when and why you said there would be no powerpoints in meetings? No, because it's a waste of time, you know. And most of the time, all the consultants they put so much data in their in the slide that you are there's a conflict in terms of reading what is written there versus hearing what they're saying. And you can always read that earlier and be ready, and you know. So you don't need that kind of when so much of data is there in those powerpoint presentation that you can't even read half the time you're battling in terms of reading that what is written that's in the true, powerpoint true. presentation there is also this theory that if there is a presentation 
the person who's making the presentation feels like he or she is selling an idea to the rest of the yeah, room yeah. so they feel more defensive about what yeah. is being presented the moment you remove yeah. that so if, it if kind there of is reduces. subject then that person is asked to sum up not through powerpoint just sum up what is contained in the presentation what that person wants to get from the group you know all right yeah i i want to latch on to a word that even in a board meetings also we don't have powerpoint presentations and i am on some external boards also i have been able to influence that please reduce all your powerpoint presentation is a waste of time all right um one of the words that you said in your earlier answer when i asked you about frameworks was analysis mm. now analysis is the act of taking something a problem before you and being able to break it up into smaller pieces yeah. and try to figure out a solution to it the opposite of that is synthesis yeah which is essentially looking and at together, the big yeah, picture right. and trying to see the connections now synthesis is much less appreciated than analysis yeah. whereas for entrepreneurs and especially yeah, is given yeah. that you've built an organization so yeah, long yeah. sometimes i'm sure your best and most creative answers came by figuring out the connections that existed yeah. is there a way that you try to teach synthesis right. to others or get them to appreciate it i don't know i'm not able to answer that question <laughs> Um, all right um i think get what you're saying get a holistic picture and and yeah. draw the connections but how to teach others i don't know but you have to get a holistic picture that's for sure that's right and you need to ensure that what are the different things which get connected to make the holistic picture far more effective that's right like but absolutely how to do it i don't know but i know how, what to do all right you are constantly learning how do you archive or store insights are you a memory person or are you a notes person i'm a notes person completely i'm not a memory person i forget <laughs> what i discuss with you if you ask me one hour later i forget you know so what is your notes method like do you take self uh, smartphone so i always notes? write down whenever in pen a meeting paper? i pen and paper for every board for example i have a book for every board i have a book what gets discussed is written in the book so it just if i want to refer i just refresh myself so i i am a strong believer that my mind is not for memory it is for analysis and you know getting results rather than memorize what is what is. so i keep so the mind free find yeah. yourself going back to your notes i yeah moment? that's the whole objective is yeah if need be i i can go back to my notes yeah. so after every meeting i'll write down what are the key things so if i have a follow up meeting then i'll know exactly these are the key things i need to take action on how are you as a person different from you as a professional are there two selves there are the differences between the personal hers harsh no, and the not profile really. i think is very much even even in terms of the purpose of the organization it's very very similar that making a difference that that's my personal purpose and the organization's purpose also then they we did a lot of insighting before we finalized the organization purpose but a lot of me has rubbed off on the organization map in in terms of the values the culture and my thought process so that's natural i am not able to differentiate between me the person and me the professional it's what? it's very integrated i would say yeah what are your weekends like weekends are golf on saturday and sunday without fail last weekend i was traveling so no golf <laughs> but otherwise uh, now i my other if the, my children are i mean my son and my grandchildren they stay in dubai so they are away but it's basically socializing in the evenings uh, normally on saturdays one would do something together but i'm not a big i mean i socialize but i i'm not like every day i socialize you know in our research it also came up that growing up at a younger age you were introverted Yeah, I have changed a lot in the last few years. I was I would not be able to speak in front of an audience. Even You said last few years. Maybe last 10 20 years. Yeah. Hmm. But in if you ask me to speak 15 20 years back, I would shudder to speak in front of 10 20 people. Now I can talk in front of 2000 people. How did you solve also. that by just forcing yourself no, to No, but be... I realized that if you are prepared and I can speak well on subjects I know, but if you give me a subject which I am not then I will still shudder, you know. because i know exactly what is the subject i know what to talk and earlier i used to make powerpoint presentation and talk but now as all my talks are, are more extempore a theme that i see running across many of the things that you do is ecosystem yeah um 
Marico Innovation Foundation, yes. Ascent. Yeah. I saw the word ecosystem even in Sharp Ventures, which is your yeah, um, yeah. family investment fund, etc. Yeah, yeah. Everything that you're doing seems, in some way, designed to be interconnected to something else. Yes. Which is a, how how do you see? When did you get interested in ecosystems, and how do you view the act of creating and connecting ecosystems in what you do? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe when I think the starting point is to make a difference, you know, and when. One is your own company managing, and when my, I think maybe the ecosystem creation came in much more after I, I stepped down from Marico in terms of creating an influence, and creating an ecosystem for innovation or entrepreneurship or in the area of mental health or, or in the area of investing. You know, so basically it starts with a desire to be a thought leader, in area pioneer. So um, I get. attracted by pioneering initiatives thought leadership initiatives where you want to do something where others respect you you know they come to you so when you do some work in in that particular area you can't do it on your own you have to create an ecosystem where you interact with all the other relevant people who can add value in that ecosystem what is it that continues to drive you today I don't know. It's something which is genetic. It is genetic because it's something which I, I enjoy doing it. I learn, but inside all that there is that desire to do something. You know, it's just not desire to relax and not do anything. Over the years, talent and culture has been very close to mm. the way you've built organizations. Has there been something that you changed your mind about when it comes to developing and growing people a younger hush versus yeah maybe in the initial stages uh, just to give an example when you were working i had there was a contractual mindset a winning mindset you know that i it's not a win win i want to win others can lose you know zero whether sum it, game ha huh, whether it is buying some material from some contractors or working with our laborers where that desire to win was high and you know it's okay others lose but it's over a period of time i said if for building lasting relationships it has to be win win you know the other party also has to feel that they won in this negotiation or whatever so and that's far more lasting far more sustainable and far better way to move forward this very interesting because i mean another way to kind of put this win lose versus win win situation is a scarcity mentality versus an abundance mentality mm-hmm. i mean a lot of us indians have been raised in a system where there is scarcity is implied yeah. right if if i'm standing in a queue and if somebody else wants to get in front of me i am getting delayed right yeah. so yeah. if he or she is winning something i am losing okay. where versus the abundance mentality yeah. is i think fine you can get yeah. in yeah. we'll both yeah. kind of get yeah. in yeah yeah what caused this change because it's not easy you came from a traditional business family and like you know uh, without stereotyping i think in the pre license raj era yeah. it was in many ways a zero sum game no so when you have that win lose kind of approach and then it doesn't it doesn't last for a longer period of time it that problem haunts you after a few years then you realize that what what why the problem is coming for example if you are able to i mean we had a 9 month strike with our laborers and we drove a hard bargain at that time feeling happy and they were feeling little within 3 years there's one more strike because they were feeling cheated you know so then you realize okay you you made a mistake in terms of driving that win lose kind of a situation you know? is 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 negotiations and leaving value on the table something that you take seriously like in i mean if i were to kind of broaden that into uh, i would think so but i don't and, and in my business there is not much of negotiation coming in but ultimately both parties should be happy that's what if if negotiation you need to arrive at a situation which is sound i mean neither party should take advantage of the other party but on a soundness basis both are happy or oh, any negotiation that's a good negotiation you know do you also read books you said oh, i read a lot of books yeah what's your method for reading it books goes on kindle changing, physical no. books no physical physical no kindle no Physi- it has to be physical i have to mark 
I have to mark, underline what is read in the book. I tell my secretary to type out what is underlined. All the underlined portion is put in, pasted in another book. I sometimes I just leave through the underlined portion. Also, you've got like a meta book which is filled yeah, with yeah. insights from yeah, all yeah. the like other books. Like not one, but five, six meta books. Yeah. All right. And and do you find the time to go back to your meta book every Depending now and then? on, I used to do it more more often earlier. But so that's one of the biggest yeah. things, right? You take yeah. notes, but yeah, yeah, do yeah. you go back? Absolutely. Interesting. Could you tell us some of the most more interesting books that you might recommend for us from any time over the last maybe year or so? Anything? I think in terms of personal, but these are books which are known. I'm sure you know. That's the, all. Right? Man's Search for Meaning, and mm. then you know, Grit, which is you know when you when you have overcome certain failure, you know, and everybody has those failures. And how do you bounce back? So the grit rather than passion, you know. So passion combined with determination and perseverance and then talk about all the stakeholders important in any organization which was written by Jagdish Sheth and Raj Sisodia talking of all the stakeholders are important not just shareholders so you have to look at all stakeholders interests whether it's employees associates society shareholders you have to try to get maximize everyone's interest and that's what makes a corporation far more impactful over a period of time and they've done study in terms of organizations which are taking interest of all the stakeholders are able to do much better financially than only organizations which are looking at the shareholders you know so and then improving board effectiveness through ram charan so a lot of books i am not able to single out one or two sure. books yeah i want to connect two three stra- yeah. strands that you talked about yeah. earlier one is you talked about working with various professors um indian mm-hmm. origin professors mm-hmm. who are now mm-hmm. abroad um working with them you talked about the Marico Innovation Foundation you talked about case studies and working with business schools etc mm. in order to kind of analyze those case studies you talked about learning now i see something at the intersection of all of this that mm. is there is there a better way to learn and teach about businesses and innovation in india because there seems to be something here that you're working with you know professors abroad mm. you're working with colleges in india it's all around yeah, yeah. indian innovation yeah, and local yeah, innovation yeah. etc i mean I, surely yes especially business schools i always feel that they are disconnected from the businesses they have to be far more higher of course the students are now doing summer training and getting exposed to industry but more importantly professors you know and i don't know any professors coming in working in any of the schools of business you know so they have to be interacting much more with the industry they have to start consulting because their salary levels are low if they are allowed to consult then they'll make much more money they'll be far more present in highly uh, disruptive environment you know what are the disruptions happening and whether it's technology or whatever geopolitical disruptions and how organizations are able to cope up with all these disruptions you know so i personally think there has to be much much stronger bond with the industry and the and the teaching academia and also the the whole system of case study based learning has limitations you know because a lot of issues are to be dealt with people and they don't teach leadership style and how to get the best out of people to me people related issues are how in your opinion how what's a better way to for instance teach some of the learnings from marico for instance to prospective indian students uh, and in in colleges no, i think there have been some case studies which are written about marico which could be i get written, that but, but that's yeah. like to take like like your point it's case study, studies no? static case studies i don't know whether you know not necessarily marico but other organizations which are doing some differential work are there enough opportunities for the students to learn from these organizations are professors ultimately professors have to mix a lot with the industry capture insights out of so many organizations and translate that into their own teaching to students to me they will be the most important influence to the students and they have to go out and meet and interact with industry to capture the learning so that it gets translated translated into their teaching style or communication so they are the pollinators in that i sense. think so yeah and then you have the case study and you know those kind of uh, pedagogy but otherwise professors can play a very important role thank you so much for your time today thank Ash. you thank really you really appreciate thank it thank you thank you